Okay. But you say you're 100% sure Miss Horton is I, not. I mean, I mean, if you sleep around with different men and you sleep with me at the same time, how can you I be know sure who the I did. is? How can you be okay. sure? I asked to sign it, but she told me I didn't have to sign. Came you know, up you know what? That's why my name is not on his birth certificate. You say she didn't let you Come sign on. the birth certificate? She told me certificate? not to. In the hospital, the woman, the nurse came in. She told me not to sign the birth certificate. When she was working at McDonald's and he was working at McDonald's, he was, she was putting in his head, oh, prove it to me otherwise. Me I otherwise. didn't say prove it to me yes, otherwise. You, did. you were talking to me. Showing a picture of a baby you don't even know is yours. Yeah, you wasn't a secret. Otherwise. The episode starts with a warm greeting from Judge Lake, who sets the stage for the drama in Horton versus Conrad. Ms. Horton and her dad assert that her mom's track record isn't exactly spotless, hence their doubt about dad being the real dad. Ms. Conrad, on the flip side, stands firm that there's zero basis for doubt, insisting today's DNA results will prove her right. The stage is set, and boy, does it look like a roller coaster is ahead. This is a case of Horton versus Conrad. Thank you, Jerome. Good day, everyone. Ms. Horton. Yes. You Jerome. and the man you have always believed is your dad have dragged your mother to court because you say she was never faithful. So neither of you believes that the man standing next to you is your biological father. Strap yourselves in. This is a wild ride. Mr. Horton lays it all out, sharing his profound doubts about whether he's truly Ms. Horton's dad, spurred by whispers and sideways glances about their mismatched eye colors. His tale of emotional turmoil and societal pressure paints a vivid picture of his conflicted feelings about his fatherhood status. What's coming next is sure to crank up the tension. Why did you decide to bring this case to court? I think it's time yeah. to find out the reason. She really is mine. I have no idea. I don't know. She was unfaithful all the time, but I raised my daughter since she was little, but I'm getting slack from other family members and friends that say that she's not my daughter. But I have brown. The whole family has brown. The mother has brown eyes. There's nobody in my family has blue eyes. 26 years old, Miss Horton, I can see how much this upsets you. Yeah. Just when you thought it couldn't get more intense, Ms. Conrad vehemently defends her certainty about Mr. Horton's paternity with a staggering 150% to 200% assurance. Her fiery declaration is a stark contrast to Mr. Horton's swirling doubts, setting up a clash that feels more like a showdown at the OK Corral. The plot thickens, and trust me, you'll want to stick around for what's next. I am 150 to 200 for sure. He is the father of my daughter, Brenda. Ms. Conrad says she's 150 to one, to 200%. Well, okay, but I, you say you're 100% sure Ms. Horton is I, not? I, bottle, I mean, if you sleep around with different men and you sleep at the same time, how can you I be know sure who when the I did. is? How can you be okay. sure? You can cut the tension with a knife here. Mr. Horton recounts a sneak attack. Literally, he pretended to go to work, then circled back to catch Ms. Conrad allegedly sneaking out for a rendezvous with another man. His story adds a layer of spice to the saga, painting a picture of deceit and suspicion. Fasten your seat belts because the ride's about to get bumpier. Miss Conrad was sleeping around with various men. I know it. Men. My kids can tell you that. She can tell you that. One time we were in the house. I act like it was going to work. I parked across the street and walked around the back and snuck in the basement. She was sneaking out the door to go across the street with some guy. One time we lived in an apartment and a friend of mine we were sitting there partying and I seen him give me eye. And I said, I'm not stupid. I said, okay, so I'm going to act like I was going to bed. I heard the door shut. I said, let me in. You heard the door and she was in there. Is this true? I have ran around on him, yes I have. Wait, did he just say that? Mr. Horton throws a curveball with a theory straight out of a soap opera. He suggests the real father might be a blonde haired, blue eyed mailman who also has a birthmark just like Ms. Horton's. It's a wild accusation that adds a juicy twist to the already tangled tale. And guess what? It gets even juicier from here. Sir, you brought an exhibit. Yes, ma'am. Okay, step over to it. All right, please. thank you. My daughter has blonde hair, the man would have blonde hair. The man would have blue eyes, my daughter's got blue eyes. The birthmark I caught, or beauty mark, what they're gonna call it, had the same. <laughs> Same mark, the same spot. I don't know for sure, but I've heard. That's the only one I don't know for sure. The rest of them, I can tell you, I knew. So this mailman delivered your mail every day and has blonde hair, blue eyes, and a birthmark. Yes. The same features as your daughter. Yes. Grab your tissues. It's about to get emotional. As the court drama unfolds, Ms. Horton's heart-wrenching dilemma of feeling torn between her dueling parents pulls at the heartstrings. Her longing for a definitive answer about her paternity is palpable, highlighting the emotional stakes at play. Stay tuned, because the climax is just around the corner and it's a doozy. I hear this man you believe is your biological father saying, from the day you were born, he has always questioned paternity. Have you felt that growing up? Honestly, no. Oh, not at all. You never felt that? I never felt that, but as I got older, I kind of turned like, I was saying, I kind of did have doubts, but my boyfriend said I looked like him. A lot of people say I looked like when him. When you started bit. having doubts, why? I just look in the mirror and sometimes I don't see him. You know what I mean? I just don't see him in me. Here it comes. The moment of truth. DNA results results are revealed. It has been determined by this Mr. Horton. You are the father. Oh my God, yes! Mommy, you were right! You were right, Mommy! Oh, I should have bleed you, Mom!
the courtroom is charged with anticipation as Mr. Conway fiercely denies being the father of Trevin Cruz. Mr. Conway is contesting his paternity of 20-year-old Trevin Cruz, despite owing over $53,000 in back child support, which has led to multiple arrests. The crowd gasps in astonishment when the staggering amount of debt is disclosed, highlighting the serious financial and emotional stakes. You might want to brace yourself because the tension is just beginning to ramp up. Mr. Conway, you are here today to prove you are not the father of 20-year-old Trayvon Cruz. Find yourself in court today owing more than $53,000 in back child support. Now, you've been arrested numerous times as a result of the child support. Prove once and for all that you're not his father. You can almost cut the tension with a knife here. Mr. Conway elaborates on the severe impact the child support debacle has had on his life, detailing the complexities and frustrations of juggling orders in both Nebraska and Missouri. His frustration over the overwhelming financial burden and the legal maze that's too costly to navigate is palpable, just when you think it's complex. Up next is a twist that turns everything on its head. Basically, this $53,000, they say, oh, well, I'm paying child support in Nebraska, but he has two orders, one order in Nebraska, one order in Missouri. I didn't know nothing about exactly where they was in 2005 till I got arrested. They and you've never hired an attorney to deal with this issue? If I had to get an attorney, I had to get an attorney from Missouri, but I live in Nebraska, so it was going to cost me way too much money to have an attorney in Missouri. Well, I'm sure it'd be less than $1,000. Yeah, it'd be a whole lot less than $1,000. Here's where it gets even stickier. Mr. Conway recounts being arrested around 10 times due to the outstanding child support, each incident throwing a wrench into his attempts at a stable life. He paints a vivid picture of a life constantly interrupted by law enforcement because of financial arrears. The saga takes another dive deeper next, so stay tuned. About, How many uh, times have you been arrested over? About 10. Every time I get a house or an apartment, soon as soon as I'm doing great. I don't care if I'm walking down the street and the cops stop me. Right. They pull me over. You brought your sister. Ma'am, I'd yeah. like to hear from you. You feel like your brother has made the Effort. I feel like he's all, every time he gets a job or something, he, he goes back to jail. By the time you've kept him from all that time, guess what? That job is gone. That apartment's gone. Now you're back on your sister's couch. As the courtroom emotions bubble over, the judge tries to restore some semblance of order as emotions hit a peak. Mr. Conway is adamant about not being Trevin's father and debates over his absence on the birth certificate. He claims he was excluded from signing it, a point Ms. Cruz contests, stirring up more confusion and heated exchanges about their shared past. Buckle up, because the emotional roller coaster is about to take another sharp turn. Well, one at a time. Oh, well, thousand dollars. Dollars. One at a time. Right. Trayvon is 20 years old. Yes, he is, Your Honor. Were you at his birth? Did you sign yes, his was, birth was, certificate? Was, Your Honor, I couldn't sign it. The day I, I asked her to sign the birth action. certificate, she told me no. I asked her to sign the birth certificate. She told me I didn't have to sign it. Came you know, up you know what? That's why my name is not on his birth certificate. You Come say on. she didn't let you Come sign on. the birth certificate? She told me certificate? not to. In the hospital, when the nurse came in, she told me not to sign the birth certificate. Now, things get really juicy. The conversation shifts to the timing of Ms. Cruz's pregnancy and Trevon birth, with Mr. Conway bringing out a calendar to underscore his skepticism about the pregnancy timeline. He argues that the dates just don't line up, hinting at potential discrepancies that might support his denial of paternity. The revelations coming up are jaw-dropping, so don't go anywhere. Your name is not on the birth certificate. You've expressed today that you wanted to be on the birth certificate. If you missed the opportunity to sign the birth certificate in the hospital, why not make arrangements at a later date? Exactly. She left town. We was doing all right. But to lose our part when we lost our apartment, she was gone for nine months. Came back in June. Told me in July she was pregnant. She had the baby in January. Wow. Can you believe this? Doubts keep mounting as Mr. Conway reveals that his suspicions about Trevon's paternity started when he was supposedly told not to sign the birth certificate. The judge notes that despite Conway's presence at the birth, his persisting doubts and lack of involvement in Trevon's life have only fueled the emotional gap between them. The stakes are about to get even higher, so keep watching. Yeah. You tell me you're pregnant in July, we having a baby in January, this math doesn't add up. Close to $54,000 dollars behind yeah. in child support. Yeah. And you say there's absolutely no way this child could be your No, you But yet he no was way. at the he, yet he was there baby. and was mad because he, cause he didn't know. get to sign he the birth certificate. That's yeah. what I'm trying to understand. That is when I started having doubts when she told me not to sign the birth certificate. Oh, so you didn't have doubts when the pregnancy yeah, was but six or seven months. Yeah, all them doubts started when she told me not to sign the birth certificate. Grab your popcorn, folks, because this is getting good. Trevon steps up and shares his side, discussing the emotional toll of his father's sporadic presence and dubious decisions. 
like the notorious strip club incident. This testimony sheds light on the personal and emotional layers complicating the legal and financial disputes. And just when you think it can't get more intense, it does. He has tears in his eyes as he talks about the earliest memory he has of his father is going on a bus and ending up at a strip club, so he gotta sit outside and wait. It's a whole never happened, y'all. He's never held up his end of the bargain, ever. He's never been... And you feel like he did not make an effort. Never made an effort. It's not hard. You're not, you're not just living for you now. You have to live for somebody else. Here comes the moment we've all been waiting for. The dramatic climax as the paternity test results are revealed. Mr. Conway, you are his father. Oh, That's wow. what I'm talking about. Get your life together. Get your life together. Oh, my, my, yeah, I question it. Man. I question it because he's questioning We don't want nothing from him. The courtroom tension is palpable as Ms. Clark accuses Mr. Newby of denying paternity under the influence of his new girlfriend, Ms. Faulkner. Mr. Newby vehemently denies the claim, arguing that Ms. Clark's infidelity is the real issue. Just when you think it couldn't get more heated, it does. You claim that you and the defendant dated for only three months before you became pregnant with his baby. Uh, you say the relationship was moving forward until he left for a woman you claim is old enough to be his mother. It is your belief that she is the reason Mr. Newby is denying paternity. You say the plaintiff was involved with another man at the time she became pregnant. You do not believe you are the father of her child and cling to do with your new girlfriend, Ms. Faulkner. An emotional roller coaster unfolds as Ms. Clark opens up about her troubled past, including her battles with drug abuse and personal loss. Her revelations shed light on the deep emotional undercurrents of the case. Buckle up, because there's more turbulence ahead. Your Honor, when I met him, I was in uh, drug use, but we were together for three months. He, he was in drug use. When he left me, I felt abandonment because when I was younger, at 13 years old, my dad had hung himself because of drug use. Five years later, my mother had died when I was 18 years old because of cancer. So when he left me when I was seven months pregnant, he, I felt abandonment and pain and agony. The plot thickens when Mr. Newby expresses his doubts about being the father due to Ms. Clark's past relationships. The revelation of a sonogram picture challenges his claims and complicates the narrative. And guess what? There's even more drama brewing around the corner. He had doubts about being a father or whatever, then why'd you have this picture taken with me with the first ultrasound and being happy with about being a father? Well, yeah, because if, if it's mine, I would love that's, that's, that's you two here with a sonogram picture. But, mm -hmm. and then when I first got the ultrasound, when she was working at McDonald's and he was working at McDonald's, he was, she was putting in his head, oh, prove it to me otherwise. To me I otherwise. didn't say prove it to me yes, otherwise. Yes, you did. You were talking to me. Showing a picture of a baby you don't even know is yours. Yeah, you wasn't it to me secret. otherwise. It wasn't said, a secret. In a surprising turn of events, Ms. Clark admits to testing Mr. Newby's commitment by sending him a picture of a fake baby. This confession adds a layer of intrigue and desperation to the proceedings. The courtroom's reaction? You'll want to see it to believe it. But I was just upset and because she he, why he had left me. You know, okay, like, he had left what me. What was your intention behind sending the picture of the baby? I need to understand that. To see if he would, like, show any interest of seeing his son because he wasn't you doing that. You showed him a picture of a fake baby as if the baby had been born. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I got a picture on my cell phone. While I was at work, I showed my manager and ran home. I don't even think I yeah, clocked out or anything. Up I just, me, you know, yes. And I just wanted to see if he would show interest or whatever, and if, you know, the son my son was born coming to see him or anything. The judge probes Mr. Newby about his efforts to support Miss Clark and the child, emphasizing the importance of individual responsibility in parenting. His responses highlight the ongoing challenges in their relationship. The next part, it's a doozy, so stick around. It is very convenient that you have Miss Faulkner to kind of help you in your yeah, potential you responsibility. Your job. I want to know what you have done individually to help Miss Clark take care of the baby. When I could, yeah. If she asked Hey, I need diapers. I would get them whenever she needed. From my vantage point, there shouldn't be a thing that you wouldn't do for this beautiful baby. There, there's not. The atmosphere in the courtroom is charged as the DNA test results are finally revealed. When it comes to three-month-old baby Richard, Mr. Newby, you are the father. Oh, buckle up for this ride. Ms. Brogdon steps up to the plate with a major claim, asserting that the late Tyrell Jones fathered her daughter, Quamira. She's here to get the family on board and support her kiddo, laying out her tough journey of raising her little one alone amid the family's denial of paternity. The stakes are high, and you won't believe what's coming up next. Ms. Brogdon, you are in court to prove to Ms. Jones and her daughter that her deceased son Tyrell Jones fathered your one-year-old daughter, Quamira. 
Ms. Sugden, you say without a doubt that your brother did not father Ms. Brogdon's daughter. You say the stress of her accusations have affected your mother greatly and is preventing her from healing after the loss of her son. Here's where the plot thickens. Ms. Sugden, standing firm and somewhat indignant, outright denies any possibility of her brother being the dad. She spills some serious tea by revealing that Ms. Brogdon wasn't just involved with one, but two of her brothers, tossing a major curveball into the paternity question. Strap in, the courtroom drama is just here. Up. Tamisha, first of all, slept with two of my brothers. So that's what left me like, I can't trust anything she says, honestly. I mean, she slept with two of my brothers. Two of them. And that's true, Ms. Brogdon? Yes, Your Honor. But you're in court saying that just Tyrell is your daughter's father. If you slept with the other brother, too, yes. could he potentially be the child's father, too? No, Your Honor. Oh, boy, did she just drop a bombshell or what? The air gets thick with tension as Ms. Sugden accuses Ms. Brogdon of juggling relationships with both brothers around the same time. Admitting to this complicated tangle, Ms. Brogdon maintains that Terrell is the only possible dad, a point hotly contested by Ms. Sugden based on shaky timelines and suspicions. What happens next? You guessed it! The drama escalates! Ms. Chambers told me that she slept with my other brother around the same time that she slept with Tyrell. So like, she slept with two brothers around the same time that she Around the same time? Yeah. That's not true, Your Honor. Ms. Brogdon, in a relationship with Tyrell? Yes. You were. Explain to me the nature of that relationship. Me and Tyrell, we were together for like three years. Like, close to the end, Tyrell start cheating, he start staying out, he start doing all this type of stuff. You're not going to want to miss this. We dive deeper into the soap opera as the court explores the rocky dynamics between Ms. Brogdon and the brothers, painting a picture of a tumultuous and emotional relationship saga with Tyrell. This backstory sets the scene for even more explosive revelations. And guess what? There's more juicy details on the way. Because your testimony just changed slightly. You said at first you only exactly. slept with Paul once the window of conception, and then you just said said now that either one of their babies, if it's not it's, Tyrell's, it's Paul, so either way, the child is related to you. I'm saying it because <laughs> that's what they say. They're trying to make me seem like Paul's my baby dad. He's not. Not my child's father at all. We don't know who your baby daddy is. Just when you think it couldn't get more intense, Miss Chambers takes the stand, shedding light on a pivotal moment at the hospital that could have nipped the paternity mystery in the bud. She highlights the deep rifts and missed chances to clarify this mess much earlier. The plot thickens, and believe me, what's next is a real job Dropper. And you're here testifying on behalf of Brogdon, yes. who claims that he fathered her child as well. Yes. What do you have to add? When she called me and said she had the baby, Tiara was at my house. I said, Tiara, she had the baby one go. What I'm going to the hospital for? Right then and then, y'all could have got DNA test done on that day. Why did Amish call? Why is she going through you all the time? She's a grown. You're right. Why Excuse did she me? go through me? But y'all don't going through you about like every me. Y'all hate. But you're a That's good woman. Opinion. If you want somebody to help true. you with your child, you be a woman about it. Get ready for the big reveal. The court is moments away from unveiling unveiling the DNA results that promise to untangle this family feud once and for all. Anticipation is through the roof as everyone braces for the truth that could end the bitter disputes. It has been determined by this court. Miss Christina Jones is related to Quamira Jones. <laughs> Mr. Paul Jones is not the father, <laughs> which means Tyrell Jones is Quamira's biological <laughs> father. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs>